to death. Okay, good morning. Welcome to the Hands On Software Defined Radio, sponsored by Ra Ra Academy. And the first thing I want to do is I want to thank Tim, Tim Brown, Scott, yep, for resurrecting the Ra Ra Academy. Um, they've done, they're doing a good job of getting the ball rolling on this thing. Okay, for those of you who don't know, my name is Forrest Schick. I'm, the, I'm a retired electronics engineer. And when Tim asked if I would do this presentation, I thought, wow, what a great chance to research the software for the software defined radio. Um, that wasn't to be, and I'll explain later in the presentation. Um, so, what I really want to show today is how, they, how we morphed from an old super heterodyne design to a, an SDR. And provide more meat than what Jim provided in the in the uh, January presentation. So some things will be similar, some things will be different, some things will be a little more in depth in hopes of learning something at an academy. So the agenda, the agenda is going to be a short sh short summary of the January presentation. Um, super heterodyne to software defined how we got how the radio evolved, not how we got there, but how the radio evolved. Um, a direct sampling, software-defined radio, a direct conversion, um, some some software programs, and well, that one's running Quisk, this one's running HDSDR, and that one's running Power SDR, which, um, well, it's on this computer, so eventually it'll go up on the screen. And then we hope to end with some hands-on and you can't transmit, <laughs> but you can you can tune around and play with the bands and things like that. And uh, Tim Brown has nicely put up a 40, 20 meter dipole for us, so we can hear some stuff. Okay, so last where we left off was we had a discussion of hardware, of radio hardware, and where DSP entered into the old super heterodyne design. Um, and how it moves to the radio. So we started with um, audio filtering and worked our way into noise blanking and all kinds of stuff until you get all the way to the latest and greatest where the computer is right at the antenna. Um, so, and he also talked about direct conversion receiver and the Taylor mixer. And um, the Taylor mixer is just a digital way of implementing a mixer, and we'll, we'll cover that a little bit. It's pretty cool. The first time I read about it, I thought, oh, i got to build something. Ten years later, I stumbled on the, this board over here, this kid over here from 5 Dash, and they did it in hardware. So I didn't have to wire up anything, just build the board, and I got to play with it. And you'll get to see some of the signals. <coughs> um, Jim then explained IQ, the in-phase in and quadrature phase signals coming out of the software-defined radio. And he did a very good job, but on that sheet with all the links, there's more presentations. Um, so if one explanation doesn't work, maybe another will. And then he did a short software review. So um, here's some, some of the uh, articles. And just, just a warning down here at the bottom, not everything you read on the internet is true. <laughs> no matter. Even if it's from a reputable company, some human wrote it. Where are we? So, here's a rig. Here's a super heterodyne receiver. Why does it happen? Here's a super heterodyne receiver. And so, I'll try to go through quickly. So, we're trying to receive a signal at 7.255 megahertz. And it's a lower sideband, so it occupies, the audio occupies that little blue area. And so we have a local oscillator. So it goes through the filtering, an amplifier. We've got a local oscillator which mixes, and you end up with a sum and difference frequency. And we select, in this case, the sum frequency through a filter and another IF amplifier. And then we got the VFO, which mixes with the 74. So you can see the math down here. And what you're trying to get to is this 9 megahertz crystal filter. So in this case, it's a subtraction in the mixing, not an addition. 
And so going through the, the Krista filter, the filter centered at 9 megahertz, here is that audio passband. And, well, back here is the, the carrier that's not with the sideband, so it's just there for explanation. Sideband signal doesn't transmit <laughs> to the carrier. And so here it is again, just, just to keep track of the relationship, way over there. And so you mix the 9 megahertz with, um, well, what does it mix? 9.00155 megahertz with the signal coming through the passband, and you end up with audio between 300 and 2800 hertz. You also end up with um, 18 megahertz, but that doesn't get through the audio. So there's the receiver, and now there's some quick um, enhancements as time went along. We got a CW filter, sideband filter, AM filtering, FM filtering, and if you're familiar with old radios, you can get different flavors of this, 200 hertz, 300 hertz, 50 hertz, or something like that. They're all, everybody tried to improve the, the radio by improving the hardware. And then you get things like AGC, audio filtering, noise blanking, notch filtering, um, and having uh, one, one radio do all the bands, so you have local oscillators that are band dependent, and the filter, this filter and this amplifier and the local oscillator change with the band, but the basic radio stays the same. And so here's the transmitter, and let me keep up with my notes, <coughs> so I don't forget to tell you something. As you can see, the transmitter looks almost like the receiver. And through the evolution of the transmitter, the same type of things, the crystal filters, the ALC instead of AGC, and different things were added. And so you ended up with a transceiver, and now you can really see the commonality, and just a matter with some switching, flipping the filter amplifier around, you can make, you can minimize the component count, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So, as Jim discussed, <coughs> as FPGAs and DSPs and things got better and better, we started out here and slowly brought the digital processing, digital signal processing, through the radio until today they put the digital signal processing, like right here. Okay, so here's a direct sampled um, radio. Again, it's hypothetical, I drew it. And all this is analog, all this is digital, and some of it's hardware and an FPGA, some of it's software. I didn't show the processor in here. Some, were the, some of it's software. And so it's interesting to note, I take the, data, I take the signal, I do an A to D, I process it, and I do a D to A to get back out so you can hear it. And coming in, I do an A to D on the microphone, process it, and do a D to A to transmit. So it's, um, both paths are really quite similar. People may researching the presentation, I, talk, I contacted different companies and people trying to learn about the software, not the radio, the software. I was hoping to get at least a block diagram or a flow chart of the implementation of the radio functions and software. The filtering, the AGC, the ALC, all that stuff. Flex radio systems would not provide information on the software because it's proprietary. James Alstrom, who developed QUISC, that's the program that's running over there, um, he pointed me to one of his articles in QEX, but it didn't come close to answering any questions I want. HDSDR, which is this one here, I wrote to that company and they haven't responded. And finally, I wrote to Ellicraft for this guy. Um, first, they told me the information was proprietary. But they provided this, this additional information. So let me read part of their email to me. He called it the business impact of SDR. And he says, hope you include this in your presentation. So because he was so nice, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you sit through it. <laughs> so why is that important? It means that the design of radios will become more firmware-based and less hardware-based. This impacts not the design, but the percentage of the radio's engineering team to be software engineers and less hardware engineers. This cascades out to mean that a larger cost of the engineering of radio will be in software. Today, most SDR radio vendors like Anon and Flex 
depend on a large developer community to sell the radios. We do things a bit differently here at Elecraft, though. The business model, however, of selling hardware and giving away the software cannot continue to be supported since a larger and larger percentage of the investment is in software, not hardware. Many of the computer vendors, HP, IBM, etc., went through this same change back in the 90s when Linux overtook the older proprietary Unix flavors. Complete platforms became commodities and less unique in design. The effect we predict is that the SDR radio hardware platforms will become more commodity-like and will be architected similar to each other. Then the operator will be able to choose SDR programs they like. We see this today where on a platform is an offshoot of the taper development. As competing vendors making similar platforms and the emergence of SDR programs to use those platforms will be the norm. I expect to see SDR programs targeting the DXR contester digital operator. Lastly, this implies that the business model of buying hardware and receiving the software for free will likely morph into a different business model where there will be platform purchases and then an SDR program purchase plus some form of web service to become the shack of the future. So first, as Jim pointed out, these four radios are all built with almost the same parts, basically. They added more features like, um, well, this is the only one that really doesn't do band switching. <coughs> Excuse me. But all the rest have band switching. Um, this one has most of the electronics inside it. This one's got the whole electronics inside it. This one's just, this one's got as much electronics as this little one over here, except it's got more filters. Um, so, the, the, excuse me, the platforms are very, very similar. Okay. So it sounds to me, I mean, I've, I've been looking at the Elecraft as a dream machine at some point, and one of the things that's interesting is that you always give away the software updates with it, but it sounds to me what he's saying is, hold on, Ralph, we're going to start charging you for software or something. No, almost. When you get to this guy, I think is my interpretation of what he's saying, okay. where your radio consists of this. It's like buying a PC. When you go out and buy right. a PC, they're all the same. So you buy a PC, you pay for the cost of the hardware, and then the software is what makes the difference. And so that's what he's saying. You're going to see different flavors of this part of the radio, and then people will sell software to enhance what you want to do. So I guess what I'm asking then, do you see folks now selling the software, or is that going to be... I haven't seen anybody selling software yet. Okay. But I've really only been studying this direct conversion, not direct sales. <coughs> okay. Um, okay, so next was just really quick about A to D conversion, because A to D and D to A is everything in the direct conversion and in the direct sample. That's, that's how you go from the analog to the digital and back to analog. So simply, A to D conversion converts the analog signal being received to a series of digital values, binary numbers, and then converts the value <coughs> transmitted back to an analog signal for transmission. And um, well, you know, I, put time, I put the times in some of the videos, so if you're, if you're wondering how long it's going to take to get to this video, I tried to help you out. Most of them are pretty good. The uh, A to D conversion is the 2x rule applies, so if you're sampling at 30 megahertz, it's, got a, it's actually has a sample 60, or is it even higher? I was going to cover Nyquist, and I thought, whoa, we only want to do this in an hour. Okay. <laughs> but yes, what he's pointing out is, and how can we show it? On, on any of these, you'll see that this, oh, this is where it gets complicated. The spectrum that's being displayed is about 48 kilohertz wide. The uh, sound cards are sampling at 48 kilohertz. So it sounds like it doesn't go along with the rule you just mentioned. But what's really happening, and I'll try to explain it later in mixing, is you're folding the right and left half of the addition is attraction into the audio pass band. So if you take, you take 7.1 megahertz 
and you mix it with 7.999 and 7.102, you have a 1 kilohertz signal on one side of 7.1 megahertz and a 2 kilohertz signal on the other side. They both come through the passband of the audio, even though they're uh, 3 kilohertz apart. It's hard to visualize it. Remind me later, I'll try and draw it. <laughs> Here's my, let's say, 7.1 megahertz. And I've got a signal here and a signal here. We'll make this one 7.099 and 7.102. And so when I mix them, I get minus 1 kilohertz and plus 2 kilohertz. Okay, so if you were, if you were going to then translate that down to audio, you would say, here's zero hertz. So I have a signal here, this is minus one, and this is minus, or this is plus two. Yet we saw in the, uh, the direct conversion receiver where I swept the signal through the passband, you could hear both of those. Well, there's no such thing as negative frequency. So this minus one ends up being a one on this side. So it just folds folds this half of the spectrum on top of that half. And it's really that simple. Yeah, and so, right, and something like the old direct conversion receiver, you need a good notch filter to get rid of the one you don't want. Or SDR looks at it this way, and it says, you know, here's, here's my signals, and I put my filter over the one I want to listen to. So while it's not negative, because, okay, you're doing zero to plus 24 kilohertz on the display, and zero to minus 24 kilohertz on the display, yet they show it as, say, seven point, oh, I can't, 7.01, and this side would be 7.058. You know, so they, they put they put all these signals on on the spectrum graph in the right place, even though I'm looking at plus and minus 24 kilohertz. So, um, so here's a a direct sampling SDR. This is one's from Flex, and now it seems to be, everybody is trying to be proprietary in the in this area. Could not find. Let's see. I could not find a whole description, but here's a block diagram. It shows it actually shows that they have two receiver paths and one transmit path. And so you got your antenna, your filtering, your input amplifier, and right into the ADC, just like the previous slide or the two two slides back. The FPGA to process some of the data it's received. Um, a processor to do whatever else needs to be done, which is um, feed information to your PC, um, handle probably handle CW. I really don't know because I have never played with one of these. But they've got that um, a processor there. You go out to your PC and it has a, a program in this case called Smart SDR. And you, you do all, at that point, you're looking at a screen similar to what you're seeing on, on these. It's just the, the computer's doing very, very little. It's all being done in the radio. So that's the flex. Here's a ICOM. I had an even harder time finding a good diagram of theirs. So I got a receiver. But you see, it's the same thing. Um, you get past all this gobbly gook, and there's your filters, your amplifier, your A to D, um, your FPGA. And see, they don't show a processor in there, but there's probably a processor in there with the FPGA to handle all the, all the um, housekeeping. D to A and then out to the amplifier. Excuse me, out to the audio amplifier. So that's a direct sample. There's no RF stage. There's no, I couldn't find the, you mean the transmitter? 
Well, or the RF amplifier. Way. Looks like the antenna is going directly into the. It's going right into the filter. Yeah. yeah. A lot of. <coughs> I think the answer to his question is yes. Yes, there's no RF in this case. Yeah. <coughs> and like, there's no RF in that one. No RF amplifier in the receive path of that one. You go right into the mixers. Okay. So now this is a a direct conversion receiver, old style. Okay, 7 megahertz filter, amplifier, mixer with a VFO and you're out of the audio. <coughs> so same thing, you're going to start at 7.255, the same incoming signal, you're going to mix it with 7.255, and so you get it. Okay, those two subtractions are these two numbers. So the 300 hertz and the 2800 hertz. You get those numbers out from the mixing, pro as mixing products, and the Excuse me, other problem get there. So you end up with um, the 300, the 2800 hertz audio signal. And here's the other mixing products, because you get a sum and a difference. So here's, here we got the difference. The sum gives us 14 megahertz, and the audio filter takes that out, so we don't worry about it. Um, so I threw a, an interfering signal in here just to just to mess things up. So here you got here's here's the, the carrier. You got the lower sideband signal we want here, and then we got this interfering signal here at 700 hertz, the other side of the carrier. And so we get this math coming out of it. The sum we go to 14 megahertz. And the difference, we go to minus 700 megahertz, or 700, minus 700 hertz. Obviously, there's no minus frequency. So it's folded, we'll call it, into the audio passband. So it ends up, it ends up, you have your, your audio signal that you want to receive, and then you have the, the interfering signal, and that's why you hear those noises when you're trying to listen. And you say this, you know, that, that, that disturbs you. So this is going to demonstrate what I just drew on the board. So what, what you're going to hear is you're going to hear, I mean, took a signal generator and swept it through the receiver. And so you hear the audio start as I come down in frequency, it starts high and goes down to low, and then it comes until it stops, and then as, it, as the signal generator continues down, the frequency comes back. So let's see if you can hear this. So that that was like that was like taking the signal and running it through like this. And so you did hear it when it got onto this side of the carrier, even though you wanted to hear this. So now we get to direct conversion, um, SDR. Okay. So the reason I'm the reason I'm going to focus on direct conversion SDR is because it's reachable. And what I mean is, we can sit down and do this. You now we we can build that board. Um, the most, except for the software, which is very frustrating, um, most of the hardware we can build ourselves. We can design it ourselves. We can go into a handbook and figure it out so it's reachable. Where the direct sampling, where you want to, want to work at 7 megahertz or 28 megahertz or 50 megahertz, it's a little outside of most of our capabilities. And I don't know about you, I don't know anything about FPGAs, and I don't know anything about writing VHDL, which is a very high, high density logic. Thank you. <coughs> so it's not in my reach. Um, and so that's why I like this, but also because of the Taylor detector. Which, anyways, so this is the Taylor detector right here. Um, So again, starting with the 7.25 megahertz and the signal we want and the interfering signal. 
and we're going to mix it with 7.250 from the LO. And what makes this different is I'm feeding zero degrees into one and phase shifting at 90 degrees into the other, which gives me the I and Q. Uh, this should be 24, 25 kilohertz, not 50 kilohertz, but because I'm sampling at 48 kilohertz. But that's a whole, that's a whole afternoon topic. Um, so you get those mixing, you get that mixing, and so coming through this filter, we're shifted down to audio frequencies <coughs> under 24 kilohertz. So here's the two signals we want to receive, we want to listen to in this band right here. Here's zero. Zero is 7.25. Well, it's 7.25. So this is really 7.25 megahertz. It, it mixes with 7.25 and becomes zero. Um, should have put more numbers up there. The 7.2547 mixes and becomes. 4,700 hertz and, 20, and the other 2,200 hertz. These are the two signals we want. Here's the carrier of the SSB signal, and then here's the interfering signal. So you can see, here's how all these signals line up. And the, coming out of the two filters, and it gets sampled. And so we haven't gotten rid of this, and you're gonna say, well, why is it, why haven't we, well, how do we get rid of it? So just quickly, just the math, it gave you the, this 2200 hertz. So I'm always feeding in 7.25, and I subtract it from these numbers and get these baseband signals. You can't call them audio because you're not going to hear anything if you listen to them. It's, well, you'll hear something. It won't be what you're expecting to hear. So, on the waterfall display, I don't know if these are shut off, but everybody know what a waterfall display is? Okay, well, remind me, of, I actually have a picture and we can talk about it later. But on the waterfall display, <coughs> even though we've, we're working between zero and 24 kilohertz, it gets, just, it gets displayed on the waterfall display relative to the frequencies we're trying to receive. So we see, you know, 7.252, 254, 257, so there, it's still there. It's in the display. So you still got the problem of how do I get rid of that? And that's where all those little filter buttons on some of these things come into play. So I put a filter in here. That's the two red lines. And the software only looks, you can't see that, only looks right here between the two red lines. The software doesn't look at those. So it came out of the mixer. There's all kinds of data coming out of the sound card with all this information, but, this, but what actually gets processed is just what's between those two red lines. So there's our filtering. That's why when you, you look at the spectrum and you see all these signals on there and you're wondering why aren't I hearing them? Because you've selected just a tiny little bit to look at. So here's the previous experiment done with an SDR receiver. Uh, and it's, this is a direct conversion, just like the one where we heard the sound come in and go back out. This is a direct conversion, but it's software defined. That's it. I'm going to go through once, and that was it. OK, a brief discussion on mixers. Just, just in case, because this can be confusing. Not as confusing as IMQ, but <laughs> it can be confusing. A mixer is basically a multiplier. So if we stop for a minute, we say, well, what about an audio or a video mixer? An audio and video mixer try to combine two signals without losing any information. No frequency change, no amplitude change, no phase change. You get out what you put in just on one wire instead of on two wires. An RF mixer, you want to keep the amplitude in phase, but you want to get a new frequency out that you can deal with. So like if I want to get from 7 megahertz to my 
but with a 74 megahertz IF, I have to mix up. If I want to get from the 9 megahertz that was coming out of the audio filter down to audio, or that was coming out of the crystal filter down to audio, I'm going to mix it with 9 megahertz in a product detector, it's a mixer, and I get audio out. I get 18 megahertz, but I get audio out. So the important thing to note is the formula is, the formula is really quite simple. Sine A, sine B equals one half cos A minus B cos A plus B. And it's the A minus B and A plus B which defines the mixing. So you see F1 minus F2 and F1 plus F2. So you don't have to know all the rest of this stuff. You just have to know that there's a formula that actually makes it work. They can mathematically prove with this formula that the mixer will work. And so you see the sum and difference frequencies. <coughs> Halo mixer. So for this slide, just I, I stole some of the material from Dan Talo. Uh, so I'm not thinking this up. So the properties are there's less than one dB conversion loss. Most mixers have at least I think six dB of conversion loss. So this one only has one dB. And this is the even cooler part. The Q of the output, the Q of the mixer, um, is very high because. If you want a two, a two kilohertz band pass, so the out, instead of a 20 kilohertz, 24 kilohertz filter on the output, you put a two kilohertz filter on the output, it doesn't matter whether you're trying to get to seven megahertz or 50 megahertz, you're only gonna look at two kilohertz. So you have this huge Q. Um, it's a simple design. Um, basic characteristics are set by an R and a C, and we'll, we'll look at that later too. So. There's the filter. Here is a, a simple implementation <coughs> where you're gonna, so if you want like 7.1 megahertz, um, you're gonna clock it at 28.4 megahertz so that it switches between these four capacitors. So here's your R and C that are creating your filter. And you can actually calculate an R and C and create the filter. And these then get combined to create the I and Q output. I don't think I showed that, but. So there, there's the receive path. Oops. Oh, so out of this, here's where it's sampling the waveform. Okay, so you get this much on one capacitor, this much on the next, this much on the next, this much on the next, and then it repeats, it starts over again. And so you're building a waveform up on these capacitors. And then you combine them, and I do have a screenshot of that actually happening. So, so Forrest, this is not something that's done in software. This is an actual circuit that you represent. Yes. And that, that, that rectangle with four times the, the fundamental, that is some kind of a switch? Yes, I have a schematic to show that later okay. on. Okay. And but this is a circuit, not, right. not an, an equation. Right. This. This is what makes the tail of the sector so cool. So I, I get a clock, crystal or a single generator or something running at 28 megahertz so I can receive seven megahertz. I get a divider that gives me four clock signals out. And then I get an analog switch, or yeah, an analog switch that I click through these four states. So this is like an analog switch and um, a divide by four stage. So you, so you get a Q and a Q bar signal that they're 90 degrees out of phase and blah, blah, blah. You get, <laughs> sorry, you get the, uh, the switch to go from here to here to here to here in, in the proper sequence to collect portions of the incoming waveform. And then the rest of the circuit puts it back together. And like I said, we'll, we'll get to a schematic later. So is that in the FPGA then? No. No? Okay. No, there's, okay, this is no FPGA. If you're asking about a direct sample, they don't have to go through this. They're right at, they're right at the audio. I mean, right at the RF. Where this is trying to get it down into the audio passband, 
where a computer sound card will process it, or a computer sound card will sample it, and the computer will be able to process it because it's not really high speed data. How much, how fast do you have to run to sample a 50 megahertz signal? You know, where 24 kilohertz signal, you only have to run 48 kilohertz. And so here's the, tra <coughs> here's the transmit version. We take the INQ from the processor. No, from the sound card. The sound card got the data from the processor. And you put it back through the same analog, same type of analog switch, same type of um, counting. And you filter it, and you've got your RF out. So while you're coming in here with signals in the, between 0 and 24 kilohertz, you're clocking it here at 28 kilohertz, which makes 7 megahertz signal. And so there's your there's your mixer, your seven megahertz plus your audio gives you your your modulated seven megahertz signal coming out. Okay. Now someone mentioned, I think Tim told me someone was totally confused by I and Q. The first video was great. Yes. So and he's got a second uh, a second model. That's this one. Yeah. And he's, so here's, here's four videos. Really, really good if you've got the patience to sit through them. <coughs> I've listened to them all at least twice. And like Paul just said, this one, this one is really good. The difference between what Jim showed us and what this shows is the way he presents it. So if, if the rotating vectors and stuff in Jim's slide were confusing, He's showing this on, a, on an oscilloscope, so you can see things happen. Anyway, so if you're interested, there's the place to go and to look at it. So, an IQ signal. <coughs> What's important about a sine wave? The amplitude, the frequency, or the time, the frequency, and then the, and the phase. So, an IQ signal is typically 90 degrees out of phase, so... I is the gold, Q is the, the brown, the red, whatever color that is. And so that's, that's what's coming out. This is not showing any modulation or anything, this is just showing an IQ signal. So if we add those two together, because that's what's going to happen somewhere along the line, I've got to put the signals together to detect them. You get a, a, a larger amplitude waveform with a 45 degree phase shift, halfway between the zero and 90. And that's, um, that's where they work with. Okay, so by varying the amplitude of I and Q, or I or Q, you get amplitude modulation. So as you change one of these amplitudes, this amplitude is going to change, but the phase is also going to change. Um, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So if you change them together, your amplitude changes. If you change them independently of the other, then you get your phase. Right. I'm sorry. You're right. If you, that's what I, yes. Funny, I should read my notes. Varying the amplitude of I and Q identically creates AM. Varying the amplitude of I and Q differently creates FM. So here's an amplitude modulated cosine wave. And so here's two amplitude modulated cosine wave, and the sum gives you an amplitude modulated sum waveform. So here's two waveforms, same amplitude, the summation, and you can see the zero crossing at the, on this one is 135 degrees, which is a 45 degree difference between blue and the orange. Now if I make the blue waveform shorter, the phase shift, there's a phase shift in the summation, see, where it was about the middle there, now it's off to the left a little, which is 157 degrees. So you shifted the phase. Um, and if I make the blue waveform larger, I've shifted the phase the other way. So I've, by just shifting the amplitude of one and leaving, in this case I just put shifting I and leaving Q 
yeah, I was shifting, I was changing the amplitude of I and leaving Q the same, you see that we have phase modulation. So one other interesting thing is, so I got I and Q coming out of my Taylor mixer. So if the RF signal is 7.105 megahertz and the LO is 7.110, the IQ signals are approximately at five kilohertz. And you can see the blue signal is leading the gold signal. Now if I come down and I make the RF signal still 7.105, but the LO 7.1, so my LO is below the RF signal, I have um, the gold signal leading the blue. So you can see the, you can see the shift. So that's kind of the key of when the signal's coming through the audio, how do I know where to put, like the interfering signal and the audio we wanted to listen to, it was on either side of the, the mixer. Well, by looking at this phase shift, I can see which, which side of zero you want to put in the waterfall. Something like that. Okay, so. Now onto the, onto the radio portion. I think we've covered enough theory. So that, there, that, was, a, that was the KX3. And they give us a pretty good block diagram. You come into the antenna, filtering, switch, switching. Boy, it's even out of focus. It's out of focus in my slide, too. Um, your band filtering, amplifiers and attenuators, this is your Taylor mixer. This is the VFO. And all of well, the sound card, everything is done inside, inside the radio. So there's no computer attached to that. There's no sound card attached to that. So all the audio processing, all the IQ processing, all happens inside that radio. But the features are all the same. Like I said, there's the Taylor mixer for receive. There's the Taylor mixer for transmit. There's the local oscillator, which is four times the desired receive frequency. These, the DSP and the processor are doing all the work. Um, see, I crossed out the page on Nyquist. So is it, is it, um, I'm a simple fan, okay, VA over here. Uh, if I'm looking at the flex radio versus the Ellicraft, is it simple to say the flex radio is more computer dependent than the Ellicraft is, or vice versa? Okay, first, <laughs> this one isn't in production anymore. Oh, okay. This flex radio. <laughs> um, right, this one, this one is computer dependent. There's a program on, the PC to make it work because there's nothing, there's no controls. It's a black box. We're listening, everything's done inside. Okay. Now, you can hook this up to a computer. Mm -hmm. they, have, they have IQ signals coming out, and so you can do all that same stuff, but you don't need to. You don't need a computer. It's there, it's done, it's out. If I could go back to Ralph's question about the difference between the Flex and the Elecraft, if you could go back to the prior slide. I, I think in the in the L craft that uh, dotted line marked RF board is actually an RF board with coils and amplifiers and crystals on that board. Um, no, it's not. That's software. No, this is a board. Yeah, but it's excuse me, it's it's, a, it's, it's filters and amplifiers. But it's not, if you're thinking of an RF deck in your, in your SV-102, it's not bad, okay? It's very similar to what's sitting there, okay? And the mixer is digital. Oh, okay, okay, that, okay. So the, that's, that's what I didn't understand. Yeah. That's so, DSP chips and stuff. No, that's over here. This mixer right here is the Taylor mixer that we just discussed, which is all digital. I sample, the incoming signal at four times the received frequency so that 
this guy can do some work on it, decode my audio okay. and all that stuff. So next, am I going the right way? Oh. So, oh, okay. It's a brief demonstration of KX3. So the first knob is varying the filter bandwidth, and you can watch watch the filter change. Sorry, I'm standing over. Push down the button to change the other side of the filter. Pushing all, pushing the buttons. These buttons, these buttons, have numbers on them. Two, three, four, seven, eight. And then you hit an enter key, and it switches the frequency, or you can dial it. Shift the, you know, we're doing LSB before, and now we're doing CW. Okay. And I have it in reverse, so I'm dialing the wrong way to get to the tone we just we had previously heard. And then this thing is so smart, it decodes the CW for you. can't read that on that display, the digital comes out to a program. <laughs> so you can see the letters and send letters back in. If you want to cheat and not use a key. <laughs> okay, so the next one is this Flex 1500, the proverbial black box. There's nothing there, a bunch of connectors. The only time you know what's on is this little blue light comes on when you push the button. And so they have a similar block diagram, they drew it differently, but here's the uh, receive TALO mixer, here's the transmit TALO mixer, Please, where's the antenna start? So you start here at the antenna, you come in through some band pass filtering, uh, receive filter, and they have attenuators, um, they have an amplifier, where's the amplifier, an amplifier for transmit. But you have your IQs coming from a low-pass filter. In this case, they're going to a low-pass filter. And the sound card, I shouldn't call it a sound card, but the sound processing is done in that box right here. The only stuff that happens out here at the PC is push, talk, key. Even the, head, even the headphones and audio are, in, are there. See, it's, the speaker is hooked to the box. So there's just some control functions happening in the PC. They're doing a lot of the work. I really don't know where the, where the work, how much is done in the box and how much is done out here because they don't give me any information on that. It's proprietary. <coughs> so here's power SDR, and that's what's would be running that. So here you see the signal, the waterfall. In this case, let me see if I got this right. They don't tell you this, but the LO is sitting right here in this particular picture. And we're, we're looking at a signal up here. So this is the case where we've got I and Q having different phases. Now, I and Q is in a nice clean sine wave because it's got all this data on it. So it's creating all this information, but because of the phase shifts, it knows where to place it. And then by turning the filter on, I only look at the, the data inside the filter. So, well, that's it. We'll, we'll see it running in a little bit. So you got, you got the spectrum graph and you got the waterfall. So you have two ways to see what's going on. I don't find, personally, I don't find the waterfall very interesting. 
before us. Does the, the software talk to a, a number of different radios with the same IQ style outputs? Or is it specific to particular no, radios? Power SDR is not talking to INQ. Well, it's not talking to an external INQ. It's talking to whatever is coming out of that box. I'm told at one time Flux Radio had a version of Power SDR for everybody to play with and modify. But that's gone away just like that radio has gone away. Um, this panel just shows the, the, the major functions how I select a band. How I select upper side band, lower side band, CW, filter bandwidth, and you can even go into variable and adjust the filter bandwidth. Yes, Tim. It's in Waterfalls next to the data. Explain why in the video that Jim did uh, for demonstrations purposes, like the Boy Scouts or other groups, that's a visual that they can relate to. Well, in my mind, the only thing this is showing is historical data. So I, somebody talked here, well, but I can see it here. Let's see, what's a good example? I don't see a good example. Well, here's, there was something going on here and it's not showing up here. So maybe I want to look over here and see if something comes up. If the band's dead, it may allow me to see some historical information on where to listen. But if I want to see who's active, it's, it's up here, at least in my mind, it's up there in the spectrum graph. Okay. So here's my, um, there's this thing. See, blue light, the only way you know it's on. stuff, isolated by a transformer, isolated by a transformer, isolated by another transformer, and there's actually optocouplers on these other signals. So the small RF portion of this design is isolated from all the digital stuff. So you've got a great chance of not having noise problems, digital noise problems. 
So, sees in quadrature. So he's got his Talo mixers out here on the other side of the filter. And here's his signal generator that's generating the 4x frequency. And amplifiers, or bandcasters <coughs> and amplifiers. It seemed to me that there was something really super extra special keen or neat about that signal oscillator there when he was talking about it. Oh, the yeah. fact that he can get down to like 0 .001 hertz or something like that. Yeah, that's what it, it had an external, I mean, it was stable across temperatures and yeah, it's, radiation. It's, and it's, by itself, it's really there. good. I don't know if they did anything else to make it even better. Yeah. But by itself, it's very good. And it's not, yeah, you can go buy it at DigiKey. It's nothing special. Putting it on a board is a bit tough. Right, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> and Carl? So here's HDSDR, which is the software that I'm running the HFIQ with. And this actually has two waterfalls and, and two spectrums. This is the RF and this is the audio. So you, you can see your audio, you can see your RF, and you know, similar to what we just discussed in the other ones. Um, there's no band change buttons. You have to change the frequency. Um, you do get selection, uh, you know, mode selection. And to change the filters, there's no filter selection buttons either. You have to drag the red lines in and out. So, you see that in a second. Sending full IQ across what is 24 IQ? kilohertz. Okay, oh, 24 kilohertz. Plus or minus 24 kilohertz. Okay, so you are moving the radio's DSP stuff around as you tune it. Yes. Okay. Well, that's been, I'm sorry. What's the name of that software? HDSDR. 
Which do you prefer, the RSDR or the HDSDR to use? It's hard to say because I can't swap them back and forth, but Power SDR is much cleaner. I like having a button that says 2200 hertz filter, 1000 hertz filter, you know, versus I drag the line and say, oh, it sounds good today, and then tomorrow I listen to somebody else and I say, oh, got to drag the filter back. You know, you're always, it remembers where you are at. It remembers where you were at when you turn it off, but you're, you're always tweaking something rather than set it up and be done. So this is this little guy over on the end, and this board is actually more complicated than it needs to be because it has a 10 watt amplifier on the end. And this is the best um, block diagram I could find of it. And again, they have the same mixers, QSE and QSD, which are the ta again the Talo mixers. Um, the LO comes in four times the LO into the divider which goes back to that waveform sample, the waveform every 90 degrees, and works in black magic and analog, and come up with I and Q. And we can see that in a minute. Ah, this is the minute. So here's, here is the schematic, the two-page schematic of, of this board. So here's your 12-volt power, your 5-volt power, and that's all for the analog stuff. And from the USB, you get the three volt power to run the small micro and the local oscillator. What does the micro and local oscillator do? Um, the local oscillator, I'm sorry, is what creates the, the 4x signal for your detector. The optocoupler is the push to talk. Um, the micro interprets whatever's coming from HDSDR. Like when you do a frequency change, it tells the oscillator to change. So here's the dividing line. Like this is all digital side. The rest of this is all analog. And so I come through a transformer with my 28 megahertz to get my seven megahertz clock signals to uh, create IQ. So, so first I'm going to look at the, the waveform right here, which is the 28 megahertz. Might be something different on this one. Well, it's 56, so I was looking at 14 megahertz. But so through the through the transformer, I get that signal into the those two dividers. Okay, did I miss something? No, nope, didn't miss anything. Oh, there we go. And then so the output of the dividers. Here are the clock signals that then run the analog switches to create I and Q. So it's just, I'm just showing that the four are 90 degrees apart. And so here's, here's the main body of that little transmitter. So the receiver's down here, the transmitter's up there, before I vary it with graphs and, and circles. This here is what generates the I and Q. This is the analog switch that those four signals came into for receive. And this here is the analog switch that takes the I and Q and creates the transmit signal. So that little circle down there is the uh, receiver. And this. Uh, I had to drive this with like 300 millivolts to make anything show up on the scope. That's a little more than you would expect to see at the input of your at the input of your receiver. So you're coming in, and that's the two signals right here going into the analog switch, the two audio signals, and they're not, in this case they're 90 degrees out of phase because they're coming out of opposite phases of the transformer. No, 180 degrees out of phase. All are faster. <laughs> Um, oh, and so this signal, okay, you see this one's at 7.1, this one's down here at 5 kilohertz, and that's coming out of the audio, this is the audio out, which goes into the sound card. So that's what, I was feeding in 
about 7.1005. So I should have been getting out about five kilohertz from the from the table mixer. So here's the transmitter. Oops. Here's the transmitter. Here's a signal coming from the computer through the sound card to the, the, the line out. The, the line in and line out are named relative to your computer, not to their function on the board. So I've got my 90 degree phase shift coming in here, and it's a five kilohertz signal. Um, oh, so we're looking at just the different points. Here's they're taking, remember we saw 0, 90, 180, and 270. Well, that's what these signals are, 0, 90, 180, and 270. And so the, it's just showing that there is, there is some phase relationship, and it does change. So you see these two are 180 out, these two are 180 out, and there's a 90 degree shift. So, so short of sitting here moving the scope around, that's the best I could do. Hopefully you could see. So the next thing is coming out of the mixer at this point into the output trans or into the transformer. I have my two 180 degree out of phase signals coming out of this mixer, and then this is this next waveform or this waveform right here is is down here where they've been added together, and finally after some filtering and going. Out this way, uh, this is the amplifier and then the output filter to get my sine wave that I wanted. Okay, so I'm running Quisk on this. I could run HDSDR on that board, which I did do, but I really wanted to try something with Pi. This became an extremely painful process. And it's still painful. Even, I haven't figured all the plugs out yet. But, so this is what Quisk looks like. And this is the large version that would run on a regular video monitor. And so you have your band switching, your audio filtering, your detection, you know, AM, FM, sideband, CW, and all kinds of other neat things like that. And then here is the small version, and to go from the large to the small, just a, a menu setting, so you don't have to learn two different programs or download two different programs, it's just a menu setting. So actually what I do is I, I set it all up on the big screen, and then I take the memory card and plug it into there, and use it on, on that, because it's just way too hard to work on that little screen. But it's neat once it's running. Is that free software, what do those uh, questions? Yeah, Twisk and HDSDR are free. And there's probably a couple others that I can't think of at the moment. So, this is this setup here.
Yeah, his kits, his RXTX kits come, I think they all only do two bands. And even though it says 40 and 20, you have to put a filter on his output for 40 or it won't pass FCC. So it's not that great. But as he keeps reminding me when I ask him questions, this was for somebody to play with. This really, this is for somebody to play with and learn SDR. This isn't the ultimate radio you want to work with. Yet, there are people out there trying to make this a seven band board. So you had mentioned that when you put this on the spectrum analyzer transmitting and it was kind of messy, that's what you're talking about the filter? Yes. Yeah, I, I put, I put, I went through all the stages so I could send back, send Tony back some pictures and um, James from Pacific Antenna, which is where the 10 line amplifier came from. And so I, I looked at it without the filters and I showed him where the harmonics and all the other junk on the signal was and then put the filter on and showed him how I cleaned it up. Well, just, I just did different things, showed him how 20 meters was better than 40 meters. And what, can, what unit is that? Our, the um, is it from five dash it's the RXTX soft rock RXTX ensemble. So you want something to play with? That's it. Okay, finally through. Any questions? Yes, sir. 